بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين أما بعد so inshallah ta'ala we're continuing this Friday night reflections with this mini series we're doing on the Ashratu Sa'a, the signs of the hour. And I aim for this mini series to be maybe three or four like Fridays long before we finish it. Because I, I don't want to rush through the book when the book has so much benefit in it and so many pieces of information about the signs of the hour. We're doing this book, which is called uh, Ashrat As-Sa'a, The Signs of the Hour, uh, which we mentioned last time by uh, Yusuf uh, ibn Abdullah uh, Al-Wabil. So inshallah ta'ala, we were talking about the fitan, the trials and the tribulations and we reached a particular trial that we didn't speak about last time. This is where we stopped. Which is the following of the previous nations. In other words, that the Muslims will begin following and imitating the previous nations. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تأخذ أمتي بأخذ القرون قبلها شبرا بشبر ذراعا بذراع فقيل يا رسول الله كفارس والروم فقال ومن الناس إلا أولئك ومن الناس إلا أولئك رواه البخاري وفي رواية عن أبي سعيد قلنا يا رسول الله اليهود والنصارى قال فمن The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said the hour will not come until my ummah takes that which the earlier generations took, hand span by hand span and forearm by forearm. It was said, O Messenger of Allah, do you mean Persia and a Rome? A Rome are yani, is what I mean we translate it as Rome, but it doesn't really mean Rome Rome. It's more like the the Europeans, yani, that's the word that the Arabs used to call a Rome. Everyone from Europe they used to call them ar rum yani the, the, the Romans or the, yani some of them translated as the Byzantines. But these, yani the people who came from, from Europe, whether the Greeks, the Byzantines, the Romans, yani all of them, the Arabs call them ar rum They said, O Messenger of Allah, like Persia, like the Persians and the Romans, he said, who are the people except them? And in the wording of Bukhari and Muslim, the Jews and the Christians, he said, who else? So this hadith indicates to us, as an Imam an Nawawi, uh, I think it was an Imam an Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, yeah, an Imam an Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, who said, the meaning of hand span by hand span and forearm by forearm, uh, and in, a, in another wording it's mentioned, shibran bi shibrin dhira'an bi dhira'a, hatta law dakhalu hujra dabbin, Taba'tumuhum. It's mentioned hand span by hand span and forearm by forearm. Even if they entered into the lizard's hole, you would follow them. Now, to explain that a little bit more, the lizard's hole, the meaning of it is it's generally a place where you find the scorpion, the scorpions, like they bury themselves around the lizard's hole. So generally, if you put your hand into the lizard's hole, you're going to get stung quite badly. And this is kind of like Imam al he said, it is, uh, he said, at tamthil bi shiddat al muwafaqa lahum. It's an example of how strongly you will try to imitate them. That even when you see them put their hands into the lizard's hole and they bring their hands out and they've been stung by how many scorpion stings, you put your hand into the same hole again. And he after them because of how much you are following them and how much you're imitating them. And there's no doubt that in this time, the Muslims have become, and this is one of the signs, like if we classified the signs, this is one of the signs that has happened and is increasing. 
Because as we said, there are some of the minor signs that have happened and finished, and some of the minor signs that have not yet happened until now. And there are some of the minor signs that have happened and they're just getting worse. And this is one of the situations. At-tashabbuh bil kuffar, al-sharqiyin wal gharbiyin the eastern disbelievers and the western disbelievers. And you see that we are in a state now where many Muslims believe the only way that we can achieve progress in our countries and in our civilizations is to be as close to those people as possible and to copy as many of their things as possible and to generally abandon, not maybe, they don't maybe say to abandon Islam, but they say to abandon anything from Islam which contradicts what those people have. And that is the essence, in essence, abandoning Islam. But that is the, the call. It's not like people will say, you know, leave Islam and become Christian. But they'll say, leave everything from Islam which would get in the way of your progress in your country and your civilization. And those people who know the reality of Islam know that the progress and, and success that comes from Allah this is what the Muslims are in need of and in the first place trying to compete with the kuffar in their domain is not something the Muslims have been given the ability to do in the first place that doesn't mean we can't be scientifically you know, amazing and, and you know, we can't be amazing doctors and engineers and whatever but trying to get everything that is in the dunya is not what Allah Azza wa Jal has put us on this earth for in the first place. We have a concern which is much, much greater than that and much more important than that. And that is to achieve Jannah and that is to take from this world whatever we need to get us to Jannah. That's the purpose of the dunya. And how many times have we said that the dunya should be your servant, not your master? Whatever we as Muslims need out of the forms of knowledge and the sciences and technology to be able to help us to get to Jannah, that's what we need. And whatever doesn't help us to get to Jannah, Allah, we have no haja for it, we have no need for it. And our, compar and our competing with the non-Muslims in this issue, Allah, will not, you will not beat them in their domain. This is their domain, the dunya. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا They know something which is apparent from the dunya. This is their jannah, this is their place. This is not your place. And so constantly running behind them and trying to achieve what they have, this is from the signs of the hour. This is from the signs of the hour. From the minor signs of the hour, and it's from Al-Fitan, and the author put it in the category of Al-Fitan. From the minor signs of the hour, and it's not, a, it's not minor as in insignificant, and it's a very serious sign, is the appearance of those people who will claim prophethood. They are approximately 30. In some of the narrations it's mentioned 30. In some of the narrations it's mentioned almost 30. And there were many of them that are known. But it's very important that the meaning of 30 people who claim prophethood is not everyone who claims prophethood because the people who claim prophethood are too many to even count. The meaning of 30 are 30 who will claim prophethood and who will be given a big following among the people. I mean, how many people have said that they are a prophet but they are just like insane people or they have like just one follower or two followers? But we mean by these 30, people who will have a large group behind them, who will become famous. Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu said, as narrated by Abu Hurairah in Bukhari and Muslim, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يبعث دجالون كذابون قريب من ثلاثين كلهم يزعم أنه رسول الله. The hour will not come until there are sent Dajjalun. يعني Dajjalun, the plural of Dajjal. And the meaning of Dajjal is an extreme liar. Kathabun, liars. Nearly 30 in number. Some of the scholars said the meaning of nearly 30, this is the accurate number. And 30 is said from the point of view of approximation. 
Like when the Prophet ﷺ said 30, he was approximating. And when he said nearly 30, this is the, any, the, 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 the precise number. All of them believe that they are the Messenger of Allah. And Thawban narrated from the Prophet ﷺ that he said, the hour will not come until, the hour will not come until certain tribes from my ummah join the mushrikeen until they worship idols and there will be in my ummah 30 liars everyone believes that he is a prophet and i am the seal of the prophets there is no prophet after me this actually gives us two signs of the hour but the author will come back to this uh, which is the sign of the hour that people from the ummah will join the mushrikeen and this is a very strong, very, very strong refutation. Very, very strong refutation of those people who say that shirk will not exist in the Ummah of Muhammad or that shirk does not exist in the Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam. Rather, as we're going to hear, the Prophet Wasallam said, the hour will not come until the, yani the rear ends of the women of Daus make the noise walking around Dhul Khalsa. Yani in other words, that the people of Daus will go back to worshipping the Yemeni Kaaba that they used to worship before. And this happened. And this happened more than once. Those people went back to worshipping their yani the idol that they used to worship. They used to call it Al Kaaba Al Yemeniya, the Yemeni Kaaba. And uh, it had an idol in it called Dhul Khalsa. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ told that the Ummah will go back, the people of Daus will go back, the women of Daus will go back to walking, or making circles around this idol, like they do of the Kaaba. And in this hadith, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تلحق قبائل من أمتي بالمشركين وحتى يعبدوا الأوثان. The hour will not come until some tribes from among my Ummah will join the Mushrikeen and they will worship idols. And there will be among my ummah 30 liars. Everyone believes that he is a pro every one of them believes he is a prophet. But I am the last of the prophets and there is no prophet after me. From those people who we know about is no doubt Musaylama al-Kadhab. Musaylama al-Kadhab claimed to be a prophet at the end of the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the one who gave him his name, al-Kadhab, the liar. Musaylama, the liar. And he was killed in the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an in the battle of Al Yamama. And it's well known that this is one of the times that Abu Bakr made sujood al shukr when he got the news of the death of Musaylama al Kadhab. Because Musaylama caused a huge fitna for the Muslims, a big, big problem for the Muslims. And likewise, uh, Al Aswad uh, Al Anasi in Yemen. Uh, and he was also killed before the death of the Prophet Sallallahu And there was a woman known as, I think it's Sajaj or Sajjaj, but I think it's Sajaj without a Shadda. She claimed to be a prophet. I don't even know what the female version of prophet, what, if there is a prophetess or something. She came to be a prophet. And she married Musaylama. And when he was killed, she returned to Islam. And she became, she became a Muslim. And likewise, Tulayha ibn Khuwaylid al-Asadi, then he returned to Islam, and like the ulama say, wa hasuna Islam, he became a good Muslim after that. And al-Mukhtar ibn Abi Ubaid al-Thaqafi, and he was one of the people who claimed to love Ahlul Bayt, and he claimed to want revenge for the death of al-Husayn radiallahu an, and he had many, many followers until he overtook Kufa, in the time of Ibn Zubair. Uh, in the time of Ibn Zubair, uh, radiallahu an. Then, then he claimed that he was a prophet and that Jibreel came to him. And Jibreel used to come to him. And that's what he, he used to claim. And Ibrahim al nakhai said that he said to Ubaidah al-Salmani, do you think that Al-Mukhtar is one of the Dajjal, that the Dajjalun, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about? He said, Ama innahu min al He's from the heads of them. So he was one of them. Yani. 
And from them is Al-Harith Al-Kadhab, who appeared in the Khilafah of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan and was killed. Uh, and, a, and a group of them in the time of Bani, the Khilafah, or the, the, the Khilafah of Bani Abbas. And no doubt the famous one in recent times, uh, this uh, Ghulam Mirza Ahmed Qadiani, who came in India and claimed to be a prophet and had many, many, many followers, still does have many followers. And uh, from the ulama, from the mashayikh, who and he challenged him and was able to refute him is Al-Allama Ihsan Ilahi Zahir Rahimahullah Ta'ala and all of you, yani, if you have the ability uh, to read uh, his books that he wrote in refutation of the Qadiyaniyah I don't know of any book that was written about the Qadiyaniyah better than the books that uh, Sheikh uh, Ihsan Ilahi Zahir wrote Rahimahullah Ta'ala Likewise, his books about the Shia are amazing yani, also and he has excellent books about the Qadianis, about the Shia, and others. Yani very, very beneficial. And you learn a lot about what the, what the groups believe. And the Sheikh, he had a major role in, uh, yani in, in combating that until he was killed, rahimahullah uh, ta'ala, yani as those who yani look at his biography will know. And from them, as it's narrated in the Hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ said, "Fi ummati dajjalun, wa'ishrun. In my ummah there will be liars and dajjals that reach 27. From them are four women. From them are four women. So we know that we heard of one of them uh, that was a woman that married uh, Musaylama al kadhab And likewise, uh, the Prophet ﷺ told that among them would be four women who would claim to be prophets. From the signs, from the minor signs of the Day of Judgment is the appearance or the spread of safety and the ability of people to move from place to place safely. This is something really strange because for us, we don't really think that much of being able to move from one place to another place safely. I mean, it's kind of like pretty much considered to be the norm for us Generally, I mean, with some exceptions in different countries, but generally, you know, we don't like find it to go from Dubai to Abu Dhabi that there's any big danger on the road or that you're scared that the bandits are going to come and kidnap you. But if you think about what the situation was like only in the short time, and even if you look at what the situation was like before the foundation of the, of, uh, the UAE as a, as a united country, or you look at what the situation was like uh, before, for example, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and people going to Hajj, that it was, con I mean, to, to be able to travel a distance safely was something unheard of. And to be able to travel a considerable distance safely was something just, I mean, almost unheard of. And in fact, I mean, you, you were, as long as you, as soon as you went out of your city or your little area, you were in danger. There were danger of bandits, there were danger of you know, being attacked by rival tribes, there were danger of one city attacking the other city and all of this, and these things that happened. This is something that very recently, <coughs> I mean within, certainly within the last hundred years, it was known to people yani, that you couldn't safely travel long distances. Now we're in a situation where this is another sign which has happened and is increasing. And to the point where you see that people are able to travel all around the world without fear, without any fear that they will be attacked or without any fear that they will be robbed or something like that. As for the hadith, then from Abu Huraira radiallahu an, the Messenger of Allah uh, said, the hour will not come until a traveler will go from Iraq to Mecca. He will only fear losing the, his way on the road. And the only thing that he will fear is losing his way on the road. They said that this happened during the time of the Futuhat, and during the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when the nations became bigger and bigger, and the, the, the Muslim empire uh, took over Iraq, then people were able to travel from Iraq to Mecca. The only thing they were scared of is losing the, the road, and losing the way, getting lost. They were not scared of bandits, they were not scared. So this is how it started. 
But this is another one that is increasing and increasing. And in some of the ahadith, in the hadith of Adi, which we covered, when the Prophet Sallallahu said to, uh, to uh, Adi ibn Hatim radiallahu an, Ya Adi, O oh Adi, have you seen Al-Hira? He said, I have not seen it, but I've been told about it. The Prophet Sallallahu said, if you live a long time, you will see Al-Za'ina. Al-Za'ina is, uh, I don't know, I keep talking about it and I don't know if anyone knows what I mean. Sometimes we call it al-hawdaj, like a, a tent that's put on top of a camel for women to ride in. So it's like the woman sits in it, and it's like a, a box. And then they, it, has like, uh, it has like covers that come over the side so that nobody can see her. Then the men lift it up and they strap it to the camel. And there are pictures on, 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 uh, on uh, yani Google images if you type in hawdaj. And you can see, like, I don't know what they call it in English, and I don't even know if they have a word for it in English, but it's like a, a box tent that goes on top of the camel and the woman travels in it. He said, if you live a long time, you will see this, yani the woman traveling in her tent. She travels from Al-Hira until she makes tawaf of the Kaaba, and the only thing she's scared of is Allah. And yani the only thing she's scared of is Allah. And that was something in the time of the... Sahaba radiallahu anhum that they couldn't have imagined during the time of the Prophet sallallahu that someone can go from the Levant, from the very very north, yani of that, you know, area from Syria, from those places, and to be able to travel to Mecca, and the only thing they're scared of is Allah subhanahu wa taala, no fear over being robbed or being attacked or something like that. And this hadith, by the way, and it's important uh, that we, yani we understand this hadith also. That this hadith doesn't provide a proof for traveling without a mahram. And some people took this hadith to mean that this hadith, it, it means to travel without a mahram. Yani it will be permissible for the woman to travel without a mahram. First of all, there is no mention of the mahram in the hadith. There is no mention of whether she has a man with her or she doesn't have a man with her. The issue is that when she travels, she will not be scared. And secondly, the, this hadith is ambiguous. It's not clear for certain whether the meaning, what the meaning is. So it's not permissible to reject a clear hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said it's not allowed for a woman who, believe, who believes in Allah in the last day to travel except with a mahram. It's not allowed for us to negate this hadith based on something that is a sign of the hour that may, yani may have happened at any one time. It's not possible for us to negate the sharia based on, uh, yani based on, on this particular issue. And from the signs, the minor signs of the hour, is the great fire of Al-Hijaz. From the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu said, the hour will not come until a fire comes out from the land of Hijaz. We know what Hijaz is. Hijaz is Makkah, Medina, and Jeddah, and Taif. Yani this peninsula, this area, which starts from Medina, and like sort of the Makkah Medina region. I mean, this is called Hijaz. The hour will not come until a fire will come from the land of Hijaz that will light the necks of the camels in Busra. That will light the necks of the camels in Busra. Busra is a well known city in Sham, in the Levant, uh, which is also known as uh, Hauran, and it's near to Damascus. And so there will be a fire that will come from the land of Hijaz that will be so bright that the necks of the camels in, near to Damascus will be lit up with it. And he will be, will be able to see the necks of the camels from the light of this fire. And this has happened. This is one that has happened and finished. It happened in the 7th uh, century after the Hijrah in the year uh, 600 and. 54. And from those who spoke about it was Al Imam al Nawawi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said, During our time, a fire happened in Medina in the year 654. And it was a, it was a vast fire. 
uh, it, it came from the side of the, the, the eastern side of Medina beyond the Harra. The Harra is the volcanic rock, the hard black rock. If you go to Medina, Medina has hard black rock on both sides. Al Harra Sharqiyya and Al Harra Gharbiya. So this came from the eastern Harra. And the Imam al Nawawi said the knowledge of this fire became widespread in the Levant and all of the cities. And he said, and I was told about some of the people who witnessed it from the people of Medina. And uh, Ibn Kathir also narrates uh, regarding it. He said, a number of Bedouins who were in the town of Busra or in the area on the mountains of Busra, they saw the necks of their camels lit up from this fire that came from the land of Medina or the land of Hijaz. And Al-Qurtubi mentioned it, al hafiz ibn Hajar mentioned it. But it's important that we understand that this fire is not the fire that will come in the major signs. So this is not the fire that will gather the people to their resting place, the last of the, the, last of the major signs. This fire was a minor sign which the Prophet ﷺ told about and it happened during the 600s after the Hijrah. So we come to yet another sign and that sign is the fighting of a Turk. Uh, a Turk is a general... Now, it's difficult to find the right term for a Turk. It doesn't refer to Turks. That's the first thing. So that's like the word a Turk. The closest thing I can find are the Turkmen or the Turkman people. Uh, but it's a generic term used for people who come from the area of, for example, Mongolia, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, and you know some of those areas of the world, and they're called a Turk. Uh, it seems they are a tribe, and as a tribe, they split up into different countries. Uh, but they have very recognizable. Uh, facial features which the Prophet ﷺ described and until today they have a very recognizable uh, facial features so an Imam Muslim narrated from Abu Hurairah radiallahu an that he said the hour will not come until the Muslims fight a Turk a people whose faces are like hammered shields they wear wool and they walk in, yani they, it's, uh, and they walk in wool, meaning they, they have woolen shoes, they have woolen shoes and woolen clothes. And the meaning of their faces are like hammered shields. And if you, if you see people who have who are genetically from that region, and by the way, there are some very good Muslims who came from that region, and yani this is not like anything that these are bad people or whatever. Yani. And they, from among them, like some of the, the, the author said, among them were some of the greatest of the Muslims, yani, from those who became Muslim later on. But one of their physical features is they have a very wide, wide faces, and their faces look very chiseled, like uh, as though they are... And that's the only way you can describe it. They have very chiseled, very hard uh, features and small eyes. And the Prophet ﷺ described uh, this in, in other ahadith. He said, uh, the hour will not come until you fight against the people whose sandals are made of wool. And until you fight against the Turk, people with small eyes and red faces. And then he mentioned with regard to their noses, it's difficult to describe, as though their faces are hammered shields. Now, the fighting of these people began during the time of the Sahaba radiallahu an. It's mentioned that they were fought during the time of Muawiyah uh, radiallahu an, during the Khilafah of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And that was the beginning. And it's mentioned also that the, and in other ahadith, it's mentioned that the Turk would defeat the Muslims and in certain battles. And certainly Muawiyah was not in favor of fighting with them. And he became very angry when he heard that his commander had engaged them in battle. He said, after I heard what I heard from the Prophet ﷺ about fighting them, I wanted that you don't engage them in battle until they engage us. 
Because there is a hadith, do not fight the Turk until they fight you. But the most, yani, the, or the interesting issue is when we come to the Tatar. And uh, the Tatar is an incredibly, yani, wallah, it's, it's an amazing period of history. And uh, yani, one of the, uh, I mean, there are, there are like, I don't know, to, I mean, obviously, think books like Al Bidaya and Nihaya and stuff like that. But one thing that I heard that I found very good. Uh, there is a podcast by a non-Muslim guy called Dan Collins called Hardcore History. And he has one particular, uh, yani one particular segment on the, on the Tatar and what happened with the Tatar, the Mongols. And it's really interesting. Yani if you get a chance to listen to it, yani I didn't see Alhamdulillah. Yani if you forward the first like 20 seconds, there's no music or anything. There's no yani just one guy speaking. Bear in mind he's a non-Muslim, but... At the end of the day, from a historical point of view, when they tell you about uh, Genghis Khan and about the Mongols and about what they did, these people literally, and he, wallah, the pe many of the scholars believe that they were Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And I think it's reasonable to say that they are from the same asal as Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Yani they are from the same, like, tribal origins or they share a tribal origin with Ya'juj and Ma'juj. These people literally destroyed the dunya, yani everything that was in it. They came and, and they, 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 were, yani they were tribesmen who lived in the plains. And they have quite a large area from Mongolia all the way like from the borders of China through to like what is now areas of, I don't know what's now areas of Turkey and Hungary and play. they have these like these flat lands and they were amazing horsemen. They actually start riding horses when they are like two years old or three years old or something like that. And they were very rare in the way they fought. They used to fight by attacking, you know, at that time you have to understand people attacked, people fought in rows. You know, armies of like 10,000 men came and stood in rows and they fought each other. These people used to come on horseback, ride very fast. They could shoot arrows on horseback, kill a whole bunch of people and just ride off. And then they wouldn't be seen for days. Then they would just turn up and kill a whole bunch of the rest of the army and then ride off. And they slaughtered literally hundreds of thousands of Muslims. In fact, Hundreds of thousands of people yani, they, they slaughtered. It's mentioned when they attacked China, one of the things that's mentioned about them is when they attacked China, the people rode, and they, they, there was a historian, and he was writing the account, said, we rode until we approached a white mountain. And when we came close to the mountain, we realized the mountain was a pile of skulls and bones from the people the Mongols had killed in that city. And it reached the point where they even got to the level where the, uh, yani, the people would commit suicide when they heard that the Mongols were coming. The women would jump from the, and the women would jump from the top of the towers and kill themselves just because they heard the Mongols were coming. That was the fear that these people struck into the hearts of, of their enemy. Of course, some of them became Muslim. Uh, quite a portion of them became Muslim, and in the end, they were they were they they fought among themselves. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala made their, yani the 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 end of their situation that they fought against themselves and they broke up, but they were able to be united behind Genghis Khan, and it is really a, is something that I think every Muslim should be aware of because there are so many lessons in it for the Muslims. Lessons about what happens when you leave your religion. And what happens when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives your enemies control over you. And then how the Muslims got out of that and how they were able uh, to fight. And obviously you have major events in that like the ransacking of Baghdad. And the loss of so many Islamic books and manuscripts that were lost. And so many of the scholars that were killed uh, at this time. Now my point in this is that uh, the scholars differ but in general we can... It, from the description of the Mongols, their description matches the description of the Turk that the Prophet ﷺ said. So there are two ways we can see this. There are other ahadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, you will fight the foreigners 
whose shoes are made of wool and their clothes are made of wool. And this is going to come in the next uh, sign of the hour that the author mentioned from the hadith of Abu Huraira, that the hour will not come until you fight a people called Khawz and Kirman from the foreigners with red faces, uh, small eyes, as though their faces are battered shields. So some of the scholars said, the Turk that were fought in the time of Muawiyah, they were the ones the Prophet ﷺ spoke about the Turk. And the ones from the foreigners that you will kill later, yani that you will kill later on, they were from the, yani, or they were, that you will fight later on, they were from the Mongols. And another says that the Mongols are from the, originally they are, they are from that tribe of people that the Arabs call a Turk. Um, they are from that tribe of, any that tribe of people. In any case, any we know that the Muslims several times fought against people who this was their description, who they wore clothes of wool and shoes of wool, and they had those very chiseled, wide faces and small eyes and very chiseled features. Uh, and uh, any the Muslims fought against them, and probably the most significant of all of those battles was the uh, the battle against the Mongols and the Tatar which happened uh, over a huge period of history. And of course, you, have, you can read more about that, in, for example, in, in Al-Bidayah wa Nihaya, and likewise and in the biographies of people like Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala. Okay, moving on to the next sign. The loss of knowledge and the appearance of ignorance. In the Sahihain from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, the Prophet وسلم, said, from the signs of the hour is that knowledge will be taken away and ignorance will take hold. And Al-Bukhari narrates from Shaqiq, I think it's Shaqiq ibn Salama, that he said that I was with Abdullah and Abu Musa, and they said that the Prophet Sallallahu said, before the hour will come, there will be days in which ignorance will, be, will descend and knowledge will be raised up. And in the narration of Muslim from Abu Huraira radiallahu an, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, time will become, يتقارب الزمان, the time, time will become close together, and that's gonna come later on, that's another sign. We're going to talk about later on. Some of the scholars said it means a loss of barakah in your time. Some of them said that it means that, uh, uh, many other things we're going to come to it, inshallah. وَيُقْبَضُ الْعِلْمِ And knowledge will be taken away. وَتَظْهَرُ الْفِتَنِ And the trials will become prevalent. وَيُلْقَ الشُّحْ And stinginess and, and you know, loving for things for yourself and not caring about other people will be, will be thrown into the hearts of the people. وَيَكْثُرْ الْهَرْجِ And killing will become prevalent. And we'll talk about each one of those as a separate sign in the time when it comes. And we know the hadith, the very famous hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhuma, that he said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu say, Indeed, Allah does not take away knowledge by snatching it from the hearts of his servants, but he takes away knowledge by taking away the scholars, yani by causing the death of the scholars. Until when there is no scholar left, the people take ru'usan juhalan, yani they take ignorant figureheads. Uh, in another narration, ru'asa juhalan, ignorant leaders or, or figures of leadership. So they ask them, meaning they ask them about the sharia. So they give them a fatwa without knowledge, fadallu wa adallu, then they misguide themselves and they misguide others. This hadith has many benefits, we just cover a few of them. But from the main thing that we want to understand is that how Allah Azza wa Jal takes away knowledge. Allah doesn't make you wake up one day, you don't remember any what you don't remember what's halal and what's haram. But Allah Azza wa Jal causes the death of the scholars. And as you can see, when those scholars die, the replacements are not coming. I mean, there are not the same caliber, the same standard of replacements are not available that, that, as those scholars who passed away. 
And this is true of every time, but it's getting worse. It's getting worse. And the time goes on and on and on and on. Now that doesn't mean there are no scholars in the world because the Prophet ﷺ said لا تزال طائفة من أمتي على الحق ظاهرين They will always remember, they will always remain a group of my ummah manifestly upon the truth. So that doesn't mean that there will, there will be no scholars in the world. But it means that these scholars will be like any, how, can you, how can I give an example? Like a, a drop in the ocean. And because they're like a drop in the ocean, it's as if they don't exist. Because there's so much ignorance and so much uh, misguidance, these people upon the truth are so few, they're like a drop, drop, little drops in the ocean. They're like little specks. You can't see them. And this is what more than one of the shurrah, the people who explained the hadith, uh, mentioned, that the meaning is not that there will be no scholar left in the world. But that, in, uh, yani as far as the people are concerned, the m most people will be taking ignorant people as their source of Islamic uh, knowledge. I just want to read you what Imam al Dhahabi said. And this, yani, you know, this is a theme in the Ashrat al Sa'a that comes again and again. It's a theme that just keeps coming again and again is that there were people in the early generations who believed that this had happened in their time. Al-Imam al-Dhahabi said, he said, وَمَا أُوتُوا مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا He said, they have only been given a little bit of knowledge. He said, as for today, then there is only a little bit of that little bit of knowledge. And he, uh, Al-Dhahabi is, I presume, is commenting on the ayah, or he's commenting on, he's at least referring to the ayah, وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You've only been given a little bit of knowledge. He said, as for today, the only knowledge that is left is a tiny bit of that little bit. Among a tiny few number of people who were few to begin with, yani. And how few are those people who act upon this tiny little bit of knowledge that they have? فَحَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ This is Al-Imam Al-Dhahabi. This is Al-Imam Al-Dhahabi who lived in a golden age of Islamic knowledge. He said, we were only given by Allah. Mankind were only given a tiny bit of knowledge. And out of that tiny bit of knowledge, there is only a tiny bit of knowledge left. And the people who know that tiny bit of knowledge that is left are a tiny group of people and the people who act upon what they know are the tiniest group of all. That is Al-Imam Al-Dhahabi. What would Al-Imam Al-Dhahabi say today? This is I mean, something that you see again and again in the signs of the hour. You see people from the Tabi'een saying that this is our time. People from the Tabi'een telling you that the ignorance has spread in our time. This is our time. And yet we look at that time as being the time of the ulama and the, and the scholars of Islam. Subhanallah, but you just see the situation and it gives truth to what the Prophet ﷺ said. There will could not come a time except that the time that will come after it will be worse. And that doesn't mean that every day will be worse than the previous day, but the general trend. And Imam al-Dhahabi is complaining that there are no scholars left in his time. And we are complaining that we wish we were in the time of Imam al-Dhahabi. And maybe in a hundred years the people will say, I wish we could be in our time. Because of all the knowledge they had access to at that time. Subhanallah. And from the most ajib yani, of, of, and the most strange of circumstances, is that we live in a time where information has never been more readily available and knowledge has never been fewer and yani smaller. We live in a time of ma'lumat, information. But we don't live in a time of ilm, we don't live in a time of knowledge. And there's, for the one who ponders on that, there is a lot of benefit. There is a big difference between information and knowledge. As for knowledge, we live in a time of jahl, we live in a time of ignorance. 
As for information, we probably have more information at our fingertips than any people have ever had in the history of mankind in terms of information. But that information is nothing without the knowledge to be able to filter it and understand it and implement it and act upon it. <coughs> and this will continue to get worse. It will continue to get so bad that we will reach what Hudayfa radiallahu an said. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, Islam will be forgotten or will be lost. And then later on in the hadith he said, until it will not be known what fasting is and it will not be known what prayer is and it will not be known what hajj and umrah are and it will not be known what charity is. And the book of Allah will be taken away in a single night so that not even a single ayah remains of it on the earth. And there will remain groups of people, a shaykh al-kabir, an old man, an ajuz, an old woman, who will say, we found our fathers saying these words, la ilaha illallah, so we say them. And that is the point to which it will reach at the end of time it will reach a point where people will not know what is salah and what is fasting. It will reach a time when people will not know what is la ilaha illallah. In some of the narrations it's mentioned, it will reach a time when no one on the earth will say Allah, Allah. And that is the level of ignorance that it will reach. It will reach a time when there is not a single person on the earth who says Allah, Allah. It's mentioned that the, yani some of the scholars have different interpretations of that. Some of them said the meaning of no one on the earth will say Allah, Allah, is no one will tell people to do good or forbid people from doing evil. Because yani no one will say, for Allah, for Allah, do this. Yani you fear Allah, ya akhi, fear Allah, stop doing it, it's haram. Yani no one will distinguish between the halal and the haram. And some of them said, no, it's upon the haqiqah, yani nobody Will, will even say the words Allah, Allah. No one will make dhikr anymore. And wallahi, yani, if you want to see how our time has become, it's enough to see that... I, mean, I, I remember wanting to ask the scholars, because you know when you are, you are studying the, the means of how people... Yani, for example, the things that take a person outside of Islam. One of the things that take a person outside of Islam is... A, a, a topic called inkar ma yu'lamu min ad-dini bi rejecting what is known by necessity in the religion and you rejecting the like rejecting something that everyone knows is a part of islam like the scholars say like saying there is no prayer for muslims muslims don't have to pray this person who says this is kafir why because they rejected something that is known by necessity. It's not like just you have to be a student or a scholar to know it. Like everybody knows that there is a prayer in Islam. Wallahi, it's got to the point now where we have started to ask the scholars, is there an excuse in this? Because we are finding huge numbers of Muslims rejecting things that are known by the, in the religion by necessity. People say, where is the rule of segregation in Islam? People say, where is the hijab in the Qur'an? There is no hijab in the Qur'an. Have we reached a point where it's not difficult to imagine that we will reach a point where the people will say, do Muslims have to pray? Because we've already reached a point where large numbers of Muslims say, is there such a thing as a hijab in Islam? Wallah, a question that never would have been asked even a hundred years ago. Nobody on the face of the earth, no Muslim on the face of the earth would have said, is there such a thing as the hijab in Islam? And everyone knew that Muslim women have to wear the hijab. And this was just something that was known by necessity by everybody. Now genuinely people are coming and saying, I don't find the hijab in the Quran. I don't find segregation in the Quran. I don't see why we have to do this. Where is the evidence that we have to do this? People saying, I don't find five daily prayers in the Quran. This is the state we've reached now, so how about where we're going to reach in 100 years or 200 years or what Allah Azza wa Jal knows best, however long this dunya will last. Where are we going to, to reach when we've reached this point already? We've reached the point where I doubt about, yani, like when someone comes to me with one of these things, 
like 50 years ago, the scholar would have said kafir and put the hukum of ridda upon them. These days we say, subhanallah, let's educate these people. Because wallah, this is the level of ignorance to which it has reached. People reject any, the most fundamental, wallah, any, it's, not, it's not mustaghrab, it's not strange to hear somebody rejecting the meaning of la ilaha illallah. People saying, is it necessary for us to worship Allah alone? What is left of Islam if people come to you and say, is it necessary for us to worship Allah alone? What is necessary if that is not necessary? Subhanallah, we have reached such a level of ignorance, but still that level of ignorance is increasing and increasing and increasing, and it will continue to increase until Allah Azza wa Jal takes away the Quran from the earth. And this will happen at the very end of time. It's one of the minor signs that will happen yani, after the major signs. That there will come a time when the Quran is taken up, the Mus'haf is taken up. Not a single ayah will remain written and not a single ayah will remain memorized by anyone. And the Quran will be taken out of the hearts and taken out of the pages. And the people who will be left are just the only people who will be left with even a semblance of Islam are the old man and the old woman who say, I remember my ancestors saying la ilaha illallah and I don't know what it means, but I just say it anyway. And other than that, we know that the hour will only come upon the worst of creation. Like the Prophet ﷺ told us, the hour will only come upon shirarul khalq, the worst of creation. And it will be the people who the hour will come, and the hour will come upon. And from the signs of the coming of the hour, are a shurat and the supporters of oppression. Uh, a shurat, the meaning of here, I mean, the word shurta, like uh, it means, I mean, of course, we use it in colloquial language to mean the police, but that's not what it means here when you read the hadith. It means, I don't know how we can explain it, like a squad, like you have like these death squads, and you know, people who are going around like as a squad of people, and they are like supporting zulm and uh, attacking the Muslims and, uh, you know, like beating them with whips and, and so on and so forth. Yani. This is like the, the meaning of it. Yani. Uh, I don't know if there's a, a good translation for that um, because I don't think it's right to translate it as, you know, like a police force because that gives you the wrong idea. Like you might limit it to things that are official and you might also put people in it who are not from it. But in reality, what it means is like a group of people who are assigned to like basically torture the Muslims and make problems for them and any, like cause any issues for them, as it will become clear in the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said there will come in this ummah at the end of time. Men, or he said, men will come from this ummah at the end of time that have whips with them, like the tails of cows. They will go out in the morning in the anger of Allah and they will return in the anger of Allah or he said they will return in the curse of Allah. And he said they will come uh, at the end of time. These groups of people who will go out in the anger of Allah and they will come back in the anger of Allah. So may Al yani be careful of being from their supporters or being from among them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, two people from the groups, or two groups from the people of the hellfire, I have not seen them. A group of people who walk around with whips like the tails of cows. They beat the people with them. And there are many narrations uh, like this, and many narrations like this. So what these are, are these are groups of people, either officially appointed or not officially appointed, who go around beating and torturing the Muslims. And this is from the signs of the, and the signs of the hour. And it's something, subhanAllah, that we have not only seen in the past, but also have seen in various different uh, countries around the world. 
that the Muslims were, you know, from among the non-Muslims and from among the Muslims. But the apparent wording of this is that these are from the Muslims. This is the apparent wording of the hadith because the Prophet ﷺ said, be careful from being among them. So it would appear that the meaning of this is that these people are not from the non-Muslims. These are people from among the Muslims who go around any like, you can say, like torturing or uh, any attacking Muslims and helping up the opp oppressive people. So this is something that has, any Allahu Adam happened, and seems to get you know to be getting worse. That there are times in certain you know in some sadly in some Muslim countries, and we're you know we're very blessed to be in a country where we have safety and security and we're able to practice our religion. But that's not the case, as you guys know, in many Muslim countries. There are people who claim to be Muslim and they go around yani, attacking the Muslims, stopping them from going to the prayer, uh, attacking the people who go to the masjid, arresting the people who go to the masjid, and so on and so forth. This has happened in countries that we have seen that are not far from, yani, not far from here, and you have seen this around the Muslim world in certain places at certain times, and these like squads of people who go around looking for the Muslims and torturing them and attacking them. This is something that has happened. And this is all from the point of view of helping the oppressive people. And this is one of the signs of the hour, any the helping of the oppressive people. And from the signs of the hour is the spread of a zina, the spread of fornication and adultery. So in the Sahihain from the hadith of Anas radiallahu an, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, indeed, from the signs of the hour, and then he mentioned some of them and he said, zina and zina will become prevalent. And from the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, that he mentioned at the end of it, وَتَشِيعُ فِيهَا الْفَاحِشَةِ Immorality will become common. And from this are those people who will declare zina to be uh, halal. And this is again one of the signs that has happened and is getting worse. But it will only reach its completion at the very end of time. Because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the hour will come upon the worst of the people. He said, وَيَبْقَى شِرَارُ النَّاسِ The worst of the people will remain. They will commit fornication like animals yani on the street. And upon them the hour will come. Yani the hour will come upon these people. And it's narrated in some of the narrations uh, from Abu Huraira that the Prophet ﷺ said, By the one my hand, by the one whose hand my soul is in, this ummah will not end until a man goes to a woman and he commits fornication with her in the middle of the road. He said, and the best of them in that day will be the one who will say, perhaps I should ta have taken her behind the wall. And the best of the people on that day will be the one who has any so little shyness that he said, it would have been better if I did this behind the wall where nobody can see. That's how prevalent fornication will become. And that will happen at the end of time. But we can see now that the, this issue of fornication has reached such a level in, even in, in good societies, it's reached such a level. So how about how it's getting worse every time? And you can see what the non, how the non-Muslims behave. Yani. For them now, marriage is a rarity. And fornication is the norm. Any yani fornication is the norm for them. And marriage is something that is like ajib for them. Yani. They, they, like for them, marriage is something strange, especially in the West. And yani when you find the people getting married, it's like really strange for them. Subhanallah, and yet we see this is getting worse and worse all the time and it will continue to get worse until the hour comes upon these people. And from the signs, any the minor signs of the day of judgment is the spreading of a riba. And wallahi, any, this is something that, again, when you read about the scholars who said that this happened in their time, you think any, if only they could see what happened in our time. And from this is the hadith uh, of Ibn Mas'ud from the Prophet Sallallahu that he said, before the hour comes, riba will become widespread. And in the Sahih from Abi Hurairah, the Prophet Sallallahu said, there will come a time 
where the person will not care where he gets his wealth from. Is it halal or is it haram? And actually, the way the author links this is very nice. He says that this is the not caring where you get your wealth from is the beginning of the spread of riba. Like it begins with people not caring where they earn their wealth from. They don't care whether their wealth is halal or whether it's haram. And then from there, the society falls into riba because once they don't care where they get their wealth from, riba becomes an easy alternative. And now look at it. There is no country in the world that isn't completely drowning in riba. That I know of, any. there is no country in the world that isn't completely drowning in riba that isn't engaged in riba and conducting riba and practicing riba and trading in riba and their, you know, like their, their transactions are based upon it and their economy is based upon it. Even the best of countries, we still see them, yani they are heavily, heavily involved in riba. Subhanallah. And this is from the signs of the hour. And it will only increase because this is another sign that has happened and it's getting worse and worse and worse until when the hour comes, you will barely find any a transaction that is not based upon riba. And even now, we struggle ourselves to even, even the Muslim who wants to keep away from riba, struggles for, to find a way to keep away from riba. And from the minor signs of the hour is the appearance of musical instruments and musicians and people declaring them to be halal. From the hadith of Sahil ibn Sa'id, Radiallahu an the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, There will be at the end of time khasfun wa qadfun wa maskh. There will be khasf, yani, there will be uh, uh, the, uh, the, the holes that open up in the earth and people get swallowed up into the earth. Like chasms that open up or sinkholes that open up and swallow the people in the earth. Wa qadfun. And uh, qadf, the, the scholars differed over what the meaning is, yani the, the throwing of stones. Yani. Wa maskh, and transformation of people from one thing to another. They said, when will this happen, O Messenger of Allah? He said, when musical instruments and singers become widespread. When musical instruments and singers become widespread. And in Sahih al-Bukhari, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said from the hadith of Abu Malik Al-Ash'ari that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said there will be a people from my ummah who will declare silk and various different types of silk and alcohol and musical instruments to be halal look at what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put music with he put it with silk and alcohol and he like he, he did not put it like in the that oh there will be some people who will fall into a bit of music and he, there will be some people who will declare silk, wearing of silk and alcohol and music to be halal. And that leads us to the next sign, which is the drinking of alcohol and the people who believe that drinking alcohol is halal. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that from the signs of the hour, and he mentioned some of them, and he said, وَيُشْرَبُ الْخَمَرِ And alcohol will be drunk. And among the Muslims will be people who will drink alcohol. And this is again something that has happened and is getting worse. So it's from the category of those signs that have happened and are, and are getting worse each time. And it's mentioned that some of them will change the name of alcohol. As the Prophet ﷺ said, there will be a group of my ummah who will make alcohol halal by giving it a name that they will name it. And this hadith is in Musnad, Al-Imam Ahmad and Sunan Ibn Majah. And this has happened already, that there have been people who call alcohol a spiritually yani, uplift, uplifting drink, mashroobun ruhi. Yani, it's like a, a drink to lift your spirits, yani, a drink to, to give you, yani, to lift your spirits and so on. And from this is this important principle that changing the name of something doesn't change the reality of that thing. 
This is really important. Because wallahi, you know, with riba, it's become the number one way that riba is fed and, and given to the Muslims is by changing the name. So they take the, the alif out of riba and they make it a ha and they call it ribah, prophet. And they say, yani, we, we, we don't charge you riba, but we charge you 2.5% profit. I mean, this is just taking an alif and making ha. Yani, taking riba and making ribah. And if you, you change the name of something, does not change the reality of something. But this changing of the names is from the signs of the hour. That the people will make these things, music, halal, what do they call it? Anashid Islamiyya. Yani, Islamic nasheeds. And not to say that all nasheeds are, are musical, but and you can see now, like you have, you have pop groups, and you have a group of yani, young guys who have concerts, who have yani, voice coach training, who sing, who dance, who you know, make music videos, and they call themselves Islamic artists. And I'm an Islamic artist, or an Islamic rapper, or an Islamic. Any whatever, any Allah Musta'an. Look at what has happened. All these things are through the same means. Taking the name and changing the name to make something else. And then telling the people, oh, it's okay because I changed the name of it. The name of something doesn't change the ruling of something. What changes something is the reality of it. So we say to the people, look at the haqiqah, look at the reality. If the reality of it is it's alcohol, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's still alcohol. If the reality of it is that it's music, it's music. Even if you call it nasheed or you call it yani, something else. And likewise, the, the reality of, uh, of riba is that it's riba. Even if you call it profit or fa'idah or benefit or something like that, it's riba at the end of the day. So changing the name of something doesn't change the reality of that particular thing. We do a couple more, inshallah, just so that we can get through because I'm conscious we want to get through as many of the minor signs as possible. Um, not doing a, a great job of getting through them very quickly, but yani, do our best. From the signs, and this is one, when I read it, it really, yeah, it really, it really br it, some of them really bring it home, and I think this one did. And that is the decorating of the masajid and competing and boasting with people about the masajid. From the signs of the hour, the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of, Anas radiallahu an, the hour will not happen until the people compete with each other regarding the masajid. Yani they compete to boast with each other that my masjid is bigger than your masjid and I've built a masjid in my name and that masjid is the biggest masjid in the area or something like that. And in a wording that the Prophet said from the signs of the hour is that the people will compete with each other in the building of the masajid. And likewise, uh, Ibn Abbas said, you will decorate your masjids like the Jews and the Christians decorated their masjids or decorated their places of worship. And the Prophet ﷺ also forbade this. Now, if you want to understand to the level this was taken, Umar radiallahu an, when he was extending the masjid of Nabawi, he forbade them to use any red color or any yellow color. And he forbade them from even putting a color in the masjid. And Umar used to consider that putting any color in the masjid is decorating the masjid. And now we see masajid, wallahi, and he, the decoration that is done for them, it's just something else here. Allahu Musta'an. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't build high quality masajid. The masjid should be built with the highest quality, it should be the best building, but it shouldn't be decorated. And you know what decoration is? Decoration is something that doesn't serve a purpose. Like writing the ayat along the top of the wall. What purpose does this serve? Don't take the ayat of Allah as a joke. They're not decoration. They're not artwork. The ayat of Allah are not there for art. The ayat of Allah used to be read to a people before you who used to fall down on the ground out of fear of Allah. And now we think, let me decorate my house and let me decorate the masjid by putting the ayat of Allah. 
all of the, you know, putting golden pillars and, and all of these decorations and these, like, you know, domes, even domes on top of the masjid. What benefit does the dome have? When did any of the Sahaba make a masjid with a dome? Wallah, there's no dome in the masajid. This is something that the people invented after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it serves no benefit at all. I remember Sheikh Abdul Mahsan al Abad used to criticize it so much. He used to say, you, lo you lose the benefit of the roof. The roof was a place of benefit. You could put a, uh, like a, a, a small uh, like accommodation on there for the mu'addin or for someone. You could use the roof as extra prayer space. You could use the, the roof for storage. And then you put this big dome that has no fa'idah whatsoever. I mean, it doesn't benefit anybody in any way whatsoever. And all it does is, I mean, Allah musta'an. I mean, it just wastes an immense amount of money. And the chandeliers. I and mean, some of the chandeliers, wallahi, I mean, if you took that chandelier, the value of it, you could feed how many thousands of masakeen, how many thousands of poor people with this chandelier. I mean, why you can't have ordinary lights in the masjid? Why have to have a big chandelier that is like the size of any I mean, Allah musta'an? So this decorating of the masjid is one of the signs which is haram. And in other words, we say that the decorating of the masjid is haram. Any excessive decoration of the masjid. And once again, we repeat, that doesn't mean not having the masjid. The masjid should be low quality or it should be bare. But the masjid should be there for the dhikr of Allah. That's what decorates the masjid. The dhikr of Allah azza wa jal. And Allah musta'an, you, you, you see so much of this. So building a good quality building that will last a long time, this is a good thing. Building good quality facilities that people can use, this is a good thing. But the decoration and putting things in there that doesn't benefit the people, or using excessive amounts of money that could be used for other things, this is haram. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best, and it's from the signs of the hour that the people will decorate the masajid, and the people will compete with each other in it. So you see that the masajid, and I'm not going to say it's, it's and I'm not going to say that it's haram for, for us to name a masjid after a person. That's not the issue. And I'm not, we don't make this like, and this is something I'm not going to say. And you can name a masjid after a person. But this issue of competing with each other about the masajid, like this issue of, you know, like that every person with a bit of money and he wants to have a masjid that's bigger than the other guy's masjid, and he saw that he can say, my masjid is bigger than your masjid. And these masajid, alhamdulillah, in this country, there's a lot of good, but it, wallah, even I'm very critical in the UK especially, that what I see of the masajid being places which are dead. Like, it's just a big prayer hall. They spend like one million, like six million dirhams, uh, like one million pounds, six million, five million, six million dirhams to build a masjid, and it's just a giant prayer hall. They don't give any thought about what the people are going to do in it, about the activities, about having, you know, Quran lessons, about having places for lessons for new Muslims. It's just, you know, let me just make a very big prayer hall where people can come and pray. And then the next guy wants to make a prayer hall bigger than the other guy's prayer hall. But wallah, it's just mujarrad musalla. It's just a musalla. It's not even a, like, it's, it has no, it's, it's like they're not alive. They have no, they're not like centers for the community. It's just like a, a prayer hall. Yani. Allahumma And the last one we'll mention today, which is number 20 on the list, is the building of tall buildings. And the building of tall buildings we've mentioned in the hadith of Jibreel, that this is not from the signs which are haram. And it's not haram to build a tall building, and it's not haram to live in a tall building. However, from the signs of the hour, is that the people will, uh, yani will compete with each other in the building of tall buildings. And this is something which is yani, clear. Uh, and in the narration of Muslim, وَأَنْتَرَ الْحُفَاتَ الْعُرَاتَ الْعَالَى in the narration of Ibn Abbas in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, it's mentioned that they said, O Messenger of Allah, who are the people, who are the shepherds who are barefooted and hungry and poor? Because we know that the, the hadith of Jibreel says, that you will see the barefooted, naked, poor, 
shepherds competing in the building of tall buildings. In the hadith of Ibn Abbas, they asked the Prophet ﷺ, who are the shepherds who will have bare feet and be hungry and poor? He said they are the Arabs. So the, the meaning of this is that the Arabs will compete with each other in the building of tall buildings. And if you just look at the history of the, the Gulf countries, and let's say like 200 years ago where they were, wallah, many people were fishermen, shepherds, like, you know, they had a few camels, they had a few sheep, they had maybe a, a fishing boat. They were simple people. And he, subhanAllah, they were not rich people. And today those same people own skyscrapers and huge buildings. And this is from the signs of the hour. And that's not blameworthy for them if they did it in a halal way. There's nothing blameworthy for them. That's not blameworthy. But the meaning of the, barefo the, the, the barefooted uh, shepherds is the Arabs. And that the Arabs will be the people who will go from being shepherds to owning tall buildings. And this is from the signs of the hour that you see in front of you today. You only have to drive down Sheikh Zayed Road to see how many all of these tall skyscraper buildings. And all of these buildings, the owners of them, many of them, if you look at their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers, many of them were shepherds, simple people. And he, who just yeah, and he had some small sheep and some cows or some camels or some yeah, and a small fishing boat. They were simple people. And within a few generations, they own, yeah, and they own skyscrapers and they own yeah, and like huge buildings. And like we said, this is not haram. Rather, this is just from yeah, and the signs of the hour, yeah, and the things that we see that show that the hour is getting close. Okay. That's all we have time for in this uh, segment. I still probably need one more lesson to finish the minor signs. So we're still going. But inshallah, the major signs, I'm planning just to summarize them in one, in one lesson. Even though in the book, he gives half of the book to the minor signs and half of the book to the major signs. But I think the major signs are quite well known by people. So what we'll do, we'll summarize the major signs probably in one lesson. Because I think a lot of people know them and a lot of people have heard classes on them before. But maybe a lot of the minor signs we haven't heard. And we've about finished almost half. But inshallah, like one more lesson, we can, you know, we can zoom through and, and finish the rest of them, inshallah. Because I think it's, it's something that we should recognize. Because the more of them you see, you realize how close the hour is. And what's the benefit of realizing how close the hour is? The benefit is for you to change your actions, to change what you're doing, to realize... That where am I going? The hour is coming. Look at the riba, look at the zina, look at the buildings outside, look at the decoration of the masajid, look at the way that people treat their parents, look at all of these things, and then say, how close the hour must be? I need to act. And I remind everyone that your hour comes when? Your hour comes in reality when you die. That's the reality of it. Okay, the day of judgment doesn't happen until the day of judgment happens. But you as an individual go into your grave and you either get the blessings of the grave or the punishments of the grave the moment you die. Allah wa ma yudriq. Maybe the, your hour will be tomorrow. Maybe your hour will be tonight. Maybe my hour will be tonight. So we shouldn't, we don't have time, ya khwan. We don't have time to, to, to plan. And like some of the companions said, that I laugh at the one who makes a plan for his life when death is looking for him. And I laugh at the person who says, in the next five years, I'm going to do this and this and this. And he doesn't know that death is coming to him tomorrow. But subhanAllah, this is a wake-up call for us. It's supposed to wake you up and make you feel two things, I think. First of all, to feel the need to quickly act upon on your Islamic knowledge and practice. And secondly, to feel the boost of Iman in knowing the truth of what the Prophet Sallallahu said. And how is it conceivable that one of these signs the Prophet Sallallahu could have known about? One of these signs. Let alone, yani I think the, the author here mentions 55 or 60 minor signs. And if, you know, it's inconceivable for, for even one of these to be right without the knowledge of prophethood. So how about to get 50, 60 of them right that you can see in front of your eyes? This should only increase you in knowledge that what the Prophet ﷺ said was true. 
and the fact that you can see them with your own eyes make them a lasting miracle that you can see from the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ that you can see with your own eyes that he said this will happen and you see it happening in front of you. Uh, and inshallah ta'ala, we will continue with this series in the next Friday night reflections. Bi ibnillah ta'ala. Uh, I just answer this question because I got this uh, question. Okay. So this question I think was delivered from the sister site, uh, and the sister says. I study tafsir at an institute where the teacher says we can't recite the Quran from the mobile during menses. And when asked, she said this is her opinion. Wallahi, we've said the correct opinion uh, is that uh, a sister can recite the Quran during menses. And the opinion that she cannot recite the Quran during menses is a weak opinion with no dalil. And the dalil of the scholars who said it is qiyas al junub the only dalil they have is qiyas upon the one in a state of janaba. And we reply to this with two things. First of all, the ahadith regarding the one in the state of janaba are not strong in the first place to even begin with, to forbidding them from reciting the Quran. And secondly, this is qiyas ma'al fariq. This is qiyas with a difference. Because the junub is able to remove janaba whenever he wants. Just needs to go in the shower and he can remove janaba whenever he wants. He just needs to take a shower. As for the woman in menses, she can't remove her menses whenever she wants. But there is a big difference between this and the harm in her not reading the Quran for seven days or eight days or ten days is a significant harm. However, she shouldn't read from the mushaf to follow the safer opinion. Actually, Sheikh Al Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, and if you, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Al Jibali, has written a summary of Sheikh al-Albani's opinion on this in a little book uh, on the ruling of menses. It's a very, very good uh, summary. <coughs> Aslan, the Sheikh al-Albani takes the opinion that there is, no, any, there is no dalil in this issue from beginning to end. Any, there, is, there, is no, there is no evidence for what they say from the beginning to the end. But what we say is to be safer. Any, to be safe, she can recite the Quran but not from the Arabic mushaf. This is safer. This is safer. Yani. Even though, I, wallah, I, I think the sh opinion of Sheikh al-Albani is qawi, it's, it's strong. Yani. That there is no evidence that the junub cannot touch the mushaf, and there is no evidence that the one in menses cannot touch the mushaf. Yani. And the evidence for this is very weak. But in any case, yani, like, uh, and likewise going to the masjid. But out of yani, uh, an abundance of caution, we say the safest opinion is she can read the Quran, but she can read it from her mobile or she can read it from whatever. Now the problem the sister has is her teacher takes a different opinion. In this case, I think that you have to respect your teacher in this regard. You personally can read the Quran at home. You can read the Quran uh, yani from the mobile or whatever you want at home. But in front of your teacher, you shouldn't disrespect your teacher by when, the, when your teacher gives you an opinion that you, you know, like you just ignore it and you come in and read Quran in front of her. It's better that you respect your teacher in front of her and then yani, at the other time. And if you think you can convince her, give her this book, uh, this Muhammad al Jibali small summary of the ruling of menses. It's a very good book and it clarifies very well uh, the fact that there is no issue in this regard. But in any case, uh, I mean, I think you should respect your teacher in that regard. Lots of the tafsir isn't from Ibn Kathir. Lots of the tafsir isn't from Ibn Kathir. Wallahi, Ibn Kathir is not the only source of tafsir. And I wouldn't want to comment any more on this issue without knowing what she teaches. And she mentioned who her teacher was and stuff like that. Um, I don't really want to kind of announce that in class and start talking about names and this teachers like this. Maybe the sister can email me. My email is tim at kelima.org and maybe we could talk about it. But I mean, personally, I wouldn't want to comment on what the sister is teaching without knowing examples of it. So if you send me like, for example, what she taught about this ayah and you were not confident about it, then you can send it to me and I can have a look if what she taught is a valid tafsir or it's not a valid tafsir. 
Um, because there's no doubt that the tafsir is more than Ibn Kathir. Not all of the, taf not all of the valid types of tafsir are found in Ibn Kathir. Um, so I think the best way of dealing with the tafsir issue is that the sister should send examples of the ayat that she felt uncomfortable with. Like she felt uncomfortable with this ayah or this ayah. And she gave me one example from Surah Al-Kahf, but it wasn't like enough for me to make a, any, to make a, uh, any, a judgment on. But if you send me a few examples of the tafsir that made you unhappy or, or feel uncomfortable, then inshallah I'll try and comment on whether I think it shows that your teacher is, you know, is doing something very wrong or whether it's just you know, the teacher can make a mistake, everyone makes mistakes. Uh, and Allah Azza wa knows best. With regard to the brothers, inshallah, if anyone has any questions, they can just catch me as they go out, inshallah. Uh, we just ca guys will just catch me as we go out, so we don't delay everyone, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.